All right, welcome back. Last of the Christological heresies that we're going to look at. The only thing I hate about doing it this way, I would love to be with you. We could discuss these things and get feedback and questions and answers. and That would be so wonderful. Just enjoy the fellowship with you. Um, who knows what God might have in the future. Maybe we'll get that opportunity. I don't know. I, I did enjoy being with you all in the past. and Thankful for modern technology. I can be with you this way. Let's talk about the next heresy, which will be the last one. And then, um, and then you know, the Christology is not just about heresies. We're going to get into um, all kinds of neat things about Jesus. But, um, but let's continue. Monothelitism. Mono means one. Thelitas comes from the word that means our will. So, monothelitism falsely said that Jesus only had one will. Now, by will, I mean our decision-making center. I'm standing here making this video because I decided to walk up here and get in front of the camera. I could have chosen to go down the road and get a hollow hollow, but we don't have those in America, so I guess I could not. I could have got on a plane and come to Manila and gotten a hollow hollow, but I chose to stay here. Um, the will, it's where you make your decisions. So, what do we do with Jesus here? He's one person. But he has two natures. So, what makes his decision? Well, the monothelitus said, well, he still just had one will. And uh, for a period of time, this was the official teaching of the church as it was run by uh, the emperors of Rome, one in particular, but uh, this was opposed by uh, Bible believers, and, and one pastor was even uh, martyred for, for saying, no, Jesus did not have only one will. He has two. So... One will is false. Jesus actually has two wills. Decision-making centers. Now let's talk about why, why that's important. And we'll look at uh, some verses. And then we're going to get into one of the big questions that Somebody is going to ask you, who doesn't know anything about this, but they are going to ask you a question one day. I guarantee it in your church. And knowing about this is going to help you give the answer. Even though you don't have to mention monothelitism to them, you're going to be able to give them the answer. So, here's the problems with Jesus only having one will. Why well, had have two? If Jesus only had one will, then let me ask you, um, which will is it? The will of God or the will of man? Well, if we have to choose and it becomes Jesus, we'll say, well, the will of God. Jesus only has one will, we would say this is a false teaching. And it's the will of God. Okay. Then he's not human. Because you and I don't have the will of God. That's not what makes our decisions automatically for us. We have a human will, right? 
We have to submit, yield. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What do you do? You, 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 you yield, yield to God. So if the decision-making center in Jesus is simply God's will, then Jesus is only a machine totally operated by God like a computer. Your computer, you sit down at it, you tell it what to do, and it does it, right? I want to go look this up or type this up or check this out on the internet or whatever. It does what you tell it to do. You're in charge, not it. And that's all that Jesus would have been. He would have been a human puppet that just went and did whatever God's will told him to do. It means that as far as his mind, he would have had to have been forcibly controlled by God's will and known certain things a normal human wouldn't know because his will or his mind was just simply divine. <clears throat> so when Jesus obeyed God, so what? What? He had no choice, right? He's just a puppet. He's just controlled by the will of God. He does exactly what he's told to do. He only has that one will, the will of God. There's no merit for our salvation in the fact that he resisted sin or obeyed his father and willingly went to the cross any more than if God had sent a robot down and programmed it to do these things. So this affects the whole atonement. And how can Jesus be our high priest if all he had was the will of God in him? Because if that's all he had, what does the Bible say about God? God cannot be tempted with evil. Right? So, how can he understand us? He was never tempted. If all he has is the divine will, the divine will cannot be tempted by evil. And then finally, If, if, if there's a will centered in the, the, the person of Christ, that would mean there's a will for each member of the Trinity. Three wills. Three, three persons, three wills, rather than one nature. You've got, you've got the one nature of God, and then you've just got the special will that's in Jesus. So... The point of the matter is there's all kinds of theological problems when you get into the idea of Jesus only having one will. But let's look at the scriptural problems. Luke 22, 42. And I hope, if you've been thinking, you've already thought of this verse. Luke 22, 42. Saying, Father, if it is your will... Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Two wills. There's the divine will. Will of God, 
part of the divine nature. And then the human will, which is connected to the human nature. It's the result of him having both. So in Jesus' human nature, he did not want to go to the cross. He had no desire for the physical pain, but more than that, the spiritual pain of having the weight of sin laid upon him. He was human like us. He wasn't happy to go to the cross and excited and, oh boy, guess what I get to do today? He prayed to his father and said, all things are possible to you. If it be your will, take this cup away from me. But not my will, but yours be done. Now, Jesus is God, right? The divine will is part of who he is. The divine nature. He's praying to his father. But the father doesn't have a separate will from the Holy Spirit or from the, the eternal son. There's one will in God. We talked about that in theology proper. That the Trinity doesn't fight with each other. They have one purpose, one will, the will of God. So when Jesus is praying to his father, he's addressing the will of God, which is even in him, in the divine nature. But he's saying through his human nature, his human nature is praying and his human will is saying, please, no, please, no, but not my will, but yours be done. And so see the beauty of this. Two wills. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered in his human nature. Jesus surrendered and presented his body a living sacrifice. So when he tells you and me to do that, he knows what he's talking about because he did it. He is not a savior. He is not a God who asks us to go on a path that he wouldn't go on. You ever had a boss ask you to do something that he wouldn't do? Not Jesus. Whatever he asks you or me to do, he's asking us to do far less than he did. But he's asking us to do the same thing and that is surrender our will. Jesus had a human nature. He had a human will as well as a divine. And his human will learned to surrender. And that is why these heresies, these points of theology are not minute, unimportant things. They're very important for you and me. Let's look at Luke chapter 2. Now, when we, when we say the will, um, the will can also be, we can say the mind, right? The, the mind is where we make our decisions. So the will or the mind, we, the, the similar sort of thing. So let's look at Jesus here. Luke 2, 40, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him and then verse 52 and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men his, his mind grew and so his human mind and human will had to come to understand what the will of God was and then surrender to it Jesus wasn't just born knowing everything. The night before he picked his disciples, what did he do? He spent the night in prayer. All night long he prayed. It was one of the biggest decisions of his life. Who are these 12 going to be? And so he prayed and he prayed and he prayed so that his mind would submit to the divine mind. 
his will would yield to the will of God. Let's look at Philippians 2.8. We were talking in this passage, we were talking about kenosis. Just because they use this passage doesn't mean this passage isn't absolutely right. It is. Philippians 2.8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. His will yielded. He wasn't just walking around with only the will of God, like some machine that naturally did what God wanted. His human will had to yield it. And notice this, his human will was not tainted with sin like yours and mine. Our wills are naturally bent against God because we have this sinful nature, but Jesus just had a human nature. But even the human nature, it can be tempted. It wants to go its own, it can be tempted to go its own way. Adam and Eve didn't have a sin nature, but they still sinned because they had a human nature, a human will, and their will, they chose not to submit to God, but Jesus did. And so, in so doing, he undid what Adam and Eve did. He reversed it. He became obedient. Even to the death of the cross. Now, verse 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We need the same kind of will he had, human will, human mind, a decision-making center that says, I will yield. Yes. Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me with my whole heart I'll agree and my answer will be yes Lord yes now we can say no and Jesus could have said no in his human will but he didn't did he Hebrews 4.15 Now, we're about to get to the question that I told you someone's going to ask you. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, remember, James 1.13 says that God cannot be tempted with evil. So this is how we know Jesus had two wills. He had the divine, obviously, because he was God. But he also had a human will because he was tempted. His mind, his decision-making center, had the opportunity to do wrong. And it felt a pull to do wrong. An enticement, maybe, is a better term. To do wrong. Now here's the big question. Somebody who doesn't know anything about monothelitism or any of this may not even know what Christology is. But goes to your church, is going to come up to you, and they are going to ask you this question. They're going to say, I know that Jesus was tempted. And I know that Jesus did not sin. The question they're going to ask you, though, is could he have sinned? Was it possible for Jesus to sin? Now, this question is not quickly are easily answered.
Because Jesus has two natures, right? Can the divine nature sin? No, God cannot sin. It's an impossibility. He cannot even be tempted with sin. But Jesus has two natures. And the human nature sin. Well, of course. Look around on the planet. Look in ourselves. Human nature is a mess. Sins all the time. But we've got a problem, don't we? Eutychianism recognizes, or what we learned in that study, that Jesus, Jesus had two distinct natures. But remember, we're not historians either. These are in one person. So yeah, he has two wills, or you could say two minds, but he's still just one person. So could the one person, Jesus, could he have sinned? Was it possible? Well, let's ask ourselves first of all, was Jesus tempted? Was he tempted to sin? Well, that's easy. The Bible tells us he was led up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We have in Hebrews 4.15, he was in all points tempted as we are. So yes, he was tempted to sin. However, this one person, the person of Jesus, was and is impeccable. Now, theological term, Impeccable. Picare is the Latin word for to sin. M. Picare means not sin. Impeccable means not able to sin. So, well, let's break this down. And, and try to explain why. Well, even though Jesus was human, Jesus is also God. And God cannot sin. Under no circumstance, under no possibility. God knows every potential outcome to everything in the universe. And if there was even one potential outcome somewhere in space time, where under these set of circumstances, Jesus actually sinned, then Jesus would not have been God. He would not have been perfect. He would not have been the Messiah. He would have been weak and flawed and failing and ultimately sinful. Because Jesus is God, he cannot sin. But because Jesus is human, He can be tempted to sin. God cannot be tempted. A human being can sin. Jesus could be tempted, but he could not sin. So you see how the two natures are working here. 
They make him able to be tempted, but at the same time unable to sin. He is able to overcome temptation, but he is also unable to be overcome by temptation. Jesus is not able to sin, but he's able to be tempted. He can defeat the temptation, but the temptation cannot defeat him. So then the question comes, and this will be their next question, I guarantee it. If Jesus is impeccable and he could not sin, then was the temptation real? Well, let me ask you a question. Just because something cannot be done, does that mean that there's not a battle or an attack? So let me use an illustration. In America, the president lives in the White House. It's heavily fortified. Now, heaven forbid, let's say that somebody was a terrorist and they decided they were going to attack the White House um, and, and they tried. Uh, if they're a regular person, though, with regular means, they are not going to succeed. Let's say they take a, a, a pistol and a baseball bat and, um, and maybe a machine gun. And they jump over the fence. They start firing the machine gun, waving around the bat, racing towards the White House. They're not going to get there. They're going to be shot down. But was the White House attacked? Yeah, it was. Temptation only leaves us when, when one of three things happen. We are tempted until one, opportunity is lost. So you're tempted to steal some money that's laying there. Um, it's unguarded and you're tempted, but then finally a guard comes back in and puts it away. So that limited your temptation. Or We sin. The money is put there in our grasp and we take it. I guess there could be a third thing. God calls it off. He makes it, intervenes and stops the temptation. But basically, it's the first two. Now, opportunity is lost to sin. That can come and go. But what if the opportunity is there? And the temptation keeps going. God doesn't intervene and call it off. Instead, the temptation just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger Eventually, we're going to sin. That's why the Bible says flee fornication. You've got to get away from the opportunity. You've got to get away from those things. You've got to pray that we don't enter temptation. God, call it off. Because if we are stuck in a tempting situation with no means to get away, and if God doesn't intervene, and it really is a tempting situation, without God's help, we are going to eventually give in. The temptation can keep increasing 
and increasing and increasing in strength until finally we give in. Left to ourselves, without the Holy Spirit, that's what can happen. Now what about somebody who cannot sin, but can be tempted? How strong can their temptation get? It can get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger because they're never going to sin. It can just get stronger and stronger. So often our temptation is limited because you and I finally give in. Your, your besetting sin, you gave in. But Jesus never gave in. So how strongly could he be tempted? An infinite amount. Now, someone might say, well, if Jesus could not really sin, then he was not really human. All along, Pastor Brian, you've been straying, stressing, Jesus is fully human. He's truly human. But if he could not sin, because he was also God, then that makes him less than human. Is that true? Well, Jesus is still human, but we're saying he's impeccable. You know what? When you get to heaven, you're not going to be God. You're going to be human. You and I are humans forever. We'll be glorified humans. Will we be able to sin in heaven? Well, thankfully, there's not going to be any temptation there. But what if there were? Um, what about the elect angels? who are in heaven now. They're not God. They're angels. We know a long time ago, a bunch of the angels fell, but these stayed. Are they ever tempted? Can they be tempted? In heaven, you and I will be impeccable. The elect angels are impeccable. But how can that be? Because you know, we can't sin. How could, how could, um, how could a human being not sin when he's tempted? Temptation comes down to this. Temptation is at the very base of it. We boil it all down. It's you and me Wanting to be God. Temptation equals wanting to be God. No matter what, what sin it is, you want to be in charge. You want to be the boss. I want to be the boss and not God. That's what's tempting to us. I mean, remember Jesus when he was tempted? Um, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. If you are the Son of God, then act like God. Command these stones be made bread. Uh, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. Put God to the test. But you, you do the thing. You make God jump. You take the role of God. Now Jesus was God, but he's being tempted in his human nature. Any temptation that comes your way or mine is because we're wanting to be God. Now, that's why temptation does not resonate with God. Why is it that God cannot be tempted? Because tempting has to do with wanting to be God. But wouldn't you like to be in charge, God? Do this. I am in charge. I am God. I do whatever I wish. Why? I, I can't be tempted? That's foolishness. But only natures that are not divine, human nature in Christ, angelic natures, 
human natures in us, they can be tempted because those natures are not God. We can be tempted. So how was it then that Jesus was impeccable? Even though he could be tempted, um, how, while able to be tempted, was not able to sin. Because Jesus, in the person of Jesus, the human and the divine nature were united. The human was united to the divine nature. Now, not mixed. They're separate, but they are in one person. Remember, one person, two natures united. The human nature was united to the divine Here's how we will be impeccable. And here is the way that we can overcome sin now when it's not removed. Because you're, we're united with God. And we're not God, but when we are united with Him, we do not sin. Let me... Read you some verses here. Romans chapter 8. Turn there with me. Look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. From the law of sin and death. Verse 4. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who do not walk according to the flesh. But according to the spirit. Verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh. You will die. But if by the spirit you put to death. The deeds of the body. You will live. And in Galatians 5.16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. When you are walking in the Spirit, you are able to be tempted, but you are not able to sin. You and I only sin when we're not walking in the Spirit. And you know what I mean. You know when you're walking with the Lord and the Holy Spirit is governing your life and the Word of God is flowing through you. It's almost easy to resist sin, isn't it? Oh, it's tempting. But you don't want part of that. As we grow older in Christ, we grow deeper in the Word. Hopefully the Holy Spirit controls us more and more. And we're walking in the Spirit more and more. As we grow in Christ. And it's not that we're not tempted. But the things of the world cannot overcome us. Like they used to. Because we're walking in the spirit. We are united with God. And when we're united with him. Sin cannot overcome us. In Jesus. The human nature. And the divine were always perfectly united thus making him truly able to be tempted, yet not able to sin. He was and is impeccable. He cannot sin because he's united to God. But the good news is that's true of you and me. That's why we should walk in the Spirit. We're letting the Holy Ghost operate in our life, when we are filled with Him, we do not sin. The evil one touches us not because we're walking with the Lord. Unfortunately, we don't always walk in the Spirit, do we? 
And when we don't, we're not only able to be tempted, but we're also able to be overcome. But Jesus was always united with God. And one day, dear ones, you and I will be permanently united with God. We'll be made like him. We won't be God. But we will be united with him. And even though the tempter won't be in heaven, even if he was, he could tempt us. He could tempt that human nature, but he could not overcome us. The good news is, he'll be banished into eternal hell as well. And so we won't even be tempted to sin. But we'll be glorified, and as the old song says, saved to sin no more. Perfected forever. All right. We're going to look at one last thing today, and then we're done. And then, uh, then we'll get into some other things next time. The Chalcedonian definition is something the early church came up with based on the Holy Scriptures that refutes all these false heresies. Now, you don't have to memorize the Chalcedonian definition. And it's not the truth because the church came up with it. It's true because it matches the Bible. But I think the Chalcedonian definition is helpful and can be helpful to your congregation in understanding who Jesus is. And it sums up everything we've been talking about. And for those who were Roman Catholics, they probably quoted it. And again, not everything in the Roman Catholic Church is wrong. It's a helpful thing here. So, the Chalcedonian definition. Maybe you can say it along with me. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same, perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood. Truly God and truly man of a reasonable soul and body, which means a rational or a real soul and body, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead and consubstantial with us according to the manhood. In other words, Jesus had a real soul and body, but that soul and body was joined with the Father according to the Godhead. It was divine. Joined with us according to the manhood. It was human. So in other words, it's not like his body was human and not divine. His body was human and divine. His soul was human and divine. In all things, like unto us, truly human, without sin, no sin nature though, like Adam before Adam sinned, but truly human, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead. Now remember that means uh, not that he was, he was not created. He was begotten. He was not made. He was begotten or generated, eternally generated. He's always there. Begotten before all the ages of the Father, according to the Godhead. And in these latter days, for us and our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood. Again, this did not change Christ. He merely added the human nature to his divine nature without mixing up the divine nature or changing it in any way. The Son of God is immutable. He does not change. He's still the same as he was for the foundation of the world, but he did add human nature to him. 
did not change his divine nature in any way. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. So get the, that's the four things we're talking about. The two natures are not confused, they're not changeable, they're not divided, and they're not separated. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one substance, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, the only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has been handed down to us. So that is the Chalcedonian definition. And um, I think it's very helpful, just like the, the Nicene Creed we looked at earlier about Jesus, talking about him being begotten, not made, not created. And this is helpful too in getting this definition down. Um, now before I end, I, I refer to this and I, just, I want to bring this point up and then we're done with this part. The last thing I want to talk about here, and I, I know I told you I was done a second ago, but I need to cover this, and we've got just enough time to do it, is the hypostatic union. Hypostatic union. Static means it doesn't change. And basically, what this says is that and sometimes we'll forget this if we're not careful. So this is important. Jesus' incarnation did not cease with his ascension, but continues for all the ages of eternity. Jesus did not just become human when he was here, and then when he went back to heaven, he stopped being human. Static, this union. That means it's always there. Jesus became human. He added that human nature to the divine in the incarnation, and it stays added. It's still added today. Jesus ascended into heaven and was glorified and is in heaven at the right hand of the Father and is glorified but he is still, of course, God, but also still human. He will forever be God, but Jesus Christ will forever have that human nature added to the divine. He will forever be human. So Jesus is forever God in the flesh. When you see him, you will be able to touch him and see the nail scars in his hands and in his feet and in his side and feel him and like Mary, grab a hold of his feet, be able to kiss his cheek. He has a body. He's forever truly God and truly man. He is forever human in his insides. I'm not talking about his guts. Talk about his soul, his spirit, that inner part. He not only got what it was to be human when he was here by experience, but he gets it now by experience. He is the son of man today. He will be as he is now, or, or, or we will be as he is now in his humanity. When we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That does not mean that we will be God, but the man, Jesus Christ, stands in heaven. And the man, 
you, the woman, you, the human, you, will stand in heaven like him, in a body like his, with a human nature like his, glorified and perfected. And while in heaven he stands, no one can bid you thence depart. Let's look at some verses, and then I'll read you a poem and we'll be done. 1 Timothy 2.5. I just made a big point. We've got to look up and see if it's scriptural, right? 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Who is our mediator today? The man. Christ Jesus. He is still man. He is still human. Revelation 1.13 And in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the Son of Man. John sees Jesus in heaven. He sees the Son of Man. Revelation 22.16 I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The root of David, we can get that, he's God. But he says, I am still the offspring of David. I am still the son of David. I descend from him, and yet I originated him. I'm his ancestor and his descendant. I made Adam who was his ancestor, but I am still his descendant. And then Daniel chapter 7, talking about that great day in the future when Jesus takes control of everything. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Not the Son of God here. The Son of Man. Coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. That all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is the one shall not be destroyed. Verse 27, Then the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Who Him? The Son of Man. One last verse. Acts seven fifty six. And said, look, behold, Stephen is dying. Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. There is a human being in heaven who intercedes for you. In a human body, he stands there. One day, you'll be like him. Oh, what love God has for us poor creatures that in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son, He added our nature to His and it's forever added. He joined Himself to us that we might be joined to Him. Oh, how wonderful is the incarnation. This wondrous man of whom we tell is true Almighty God. He bought our souls from death and hell. The price, his own heart's blood. That human heart he still retains, though throned in highest bliss. 
and fills each tempted member's pains, for their affliction is his. Thank you, Joseph Hart. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for our great Savior. May we trust him. May we worship him. May we rejoice that one day we will be like him. Thank you that you joined yourself to us. We might be saved and be joined to you. Wonder of wonders. How can it be? We don't know, but we believe it. I bless these dear folks, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now when we get together next time, we will look at some more things in Christology, but uh, we're going to look at what Jesus did I, in his life here on earth and, and before he came to earth. This will be a little more familiar to you. It won't be quite as deep theology. It'll be more the story of Jesus, which we all know and love. And, uh, and then after we finish that, that'll wrap up Christology. God bless you.